Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Anthony Salas, and on behalf of the American Marketing Association, I want to welcome you to our webcast today, brought to you by Telerik, the creators of Sitefinity, and titled the Top Five, excuse me, the Top Five Challenges When Scaling a Digital Business. As part of our continuing efforts to be the most relevant force and voice shaping marketing around the world, the AMA offers a variety of resources, training, and tools to enhance lifelong learning and provide you with valuable information and connections. We do invite you to go to AMA.org and click through the various resources that are available. And um, you can see the full listing of our upcoming events both in person and online. So again, at your convenience, please do go visit AMA.org. Just a few quick housekeeping items to go over with you before we start today's presentation. We are recording the full um, webcast here, and we'll make it available to you very soon after, so look for that coming your way. If you can join us today on Twitter, we would appreciate your engagement at hashtag digital marketing. So feel free to send out some tweets as the presentation goes on. Again, the hashtag is digital marketing. And if you have questions, please use the chat feature that you see there to the left of your screen. Any technical questions you might have, you can enter in there as well, and we'll get to those as quickly as possible. Content-related questions, we do ask that you enter those as the presentation goes on. We will add those to our list of questions and then be addressing them at the end of the formal presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers who are joining us today. We're being joined by Laura Kretchenova, who is the Principal with Scratch Marketing and Media, and Robert Matson, who is the Director of uh, Sitefinity Product Marketing with Telerik, the creators of Sitefinity. So Laura and Robert have a lot of great information and insights they're going to be sharing with you over the next hour. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Robert to start today's presentation. Thanks, Anthony. I do appreciate it. And let me add my thanks to the uh, folks that, ch that are spending their day uh, with us today. It really is a, a good time to uh, to take a look at these type of issues with what we hear about the uh, the organizations that we talk to on a week to week basis. And I know that Laura talks to many of the same types of organizations, and many of them are challenged with really spanning uh, this new digital world and how they add, how they really add their ability to scale to it. So. When we started taking up this question, we uh, started talking to the folks at Scratch, and they had some of the same questions in their head. And so we worked with them on the upcoming report. And folks, just because you're attending today, we're going to get you that report uh, as soon as it's released, and maybe even a day or so before uh, for the people who are kind enough to join us today to make sure you have access to all the data you're going to see today and a whole lot more. So the report really cycled around a number of different areas. So how are brands really tackling the challenges of managing uh, really these multiple websites? So whether they are multiple because they are multiple brands or multiple locations or multiple countries, whether they are dealing with the challenge of mobile versus, uh, versus traditional digital, uh, all of those came into our minds. So we wanted to take a look at what are those top challenges and then how are organizations really helping to apply either processes or technology to try to address these types of challenges. So we went out and uh, the Scratch folks interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people uh, and got their view. And we're going to go over the raw data today and show you what we found out and also try to dig a little bit under the covers and give you some of our thoughts on what we think some of that data means. So with that said, I am going to be uh, more of your color commentator today. Uh, but for carrying the bulk of the work and being kind of your play-by-play -play person, uh, we're going to pass it over to Laura from Scratch. Laura, why don't you tell us a little bit about Scratch overall? Sure. Um, hi, uh, hi, everyone. This is Laura Quadrinova from Scratch Marketing and Media. Excuse the nasal voice. Um, I got a call a, a few days ago and still uh, battling with that. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, hopefully, you'll find the next hour very informative. So just quickly about Scratch Marketing and Media, we are an end-to-end -end digital marketing agency focused on the B2B technology space. We work with a lot of technology companies that cover applications all the way down to um, the infrastructure stack, and we span digital and strategic marketing, what we call brand authority, and then sales enablement. These are some of the, the companies we work with, um, um, again, spanning, spanning big and small and high growth companies. 
So enough about Scratch. Let's focus on why you folks are here today. As Robert mentioned, what we did was we partnered with Sitefinity and Robert's team to understand some of these challenges that organizations are facing of how are they managing their increasing number of websites, be that mobile or, as Robert said, traditional digital. So we actually conducted an, an industry-wide survey. We had about 268 responses to the survey, and as you can see, we're pretty lucky in getting organizations that span the entire globe, uh, different uh, revenues uh, per company. We have big enterprise companies with over a billion, as well as smaller, high-growth companies with less than 10 million. The respondents were um, uh, interesting for us because we got a good swath of operational and IT folks, and we also had marketing, content, and branding folks. Um, and as you can see, um, we have global, we have companies that are operating in several countries, and then companies that are focused in just one region or one country. So just to set the tables in terms of what we found uh, from, from our survey, what we're seeing is that the majority of companies are managing between two and five websites. So this notion of having a website is dead at this point. Um, we're seeing that, you know, for a whole host of reasons, and we'll go through that, but we're, we're seeing that um, global companies obviously need to manage more digital properties um, and uh, as opposed to those who are managing, uh, who, are, who are based on the, uh, from one country, where we see more the norm being two to five. Um, and then those who are global companies, you can see that the, the number of websites that folks need to manage are exponentially growing, and some of them are managing more than 51 websites uh, for their company, multiple brands, multiple locations. So at this point, we just wanted to take a quick peek into who's joining us today and see if you folks can um, answer this quick question so that we can get a better sense of the audience, and we can obviously tailor some of the commentary um, to uh, to what your primary responsibilities are. And the interesting thing, Laura, is that of course we're doing this through the AMA, so we assume that uh, most of the folks in the call are either marketing folks or people that are closely in line with marketing. So if we based upon the uh, the assumption that everyone we're talking to is pretty much marketing, uh, as I see the results coming in, and we're seeing that. We're a little over 40% for people saying that they are responsible. We get a little into 30% saying that they are not, and then about about the same number, about 30% for partially. Uh, so again, I think when we take a look at it, that we know that from our conversations, that usually there's a split. That we see a lot of people that are in marketing say, listen, even though we supply content, we're really not managing our organization's website, and many times just because it's too technically challenging. Yep, so, yeah, and we'll go through some of that data. It's very fascinating to see how the results are still polling as, as we go. Um, and, we'll, and folks, we'll have a few more polls as we go along. Just to, uh, This is just kind of your early practice run, so we'll, have, <laughs> we'll be asking more information of you as we move along throughout the course of the hour. Okay, so it's great to see that the majority of the folks are either responsible or partially responsible for managing their web properties, so hopefully um, what we share with you today would be of a direct value to your to, uh, to your work. And it could be, of course, that some of the folks here just their marketing team does manage their website, but potentially they're not part of that team. So I think there's, a, there's an other there as well. <laughs> exactly. So if we can uh, uh, go to the reason why we're seeing increased number of websites uh, by company, even if uh, they're just based out uh, of one country, what we're seeing is that really the response from organizations and companies is, is heightened consumer expectation, that we need to be there for the consumer 24-7 on their mobile devices as well as online. And then we see that what's interesting in here, and Robert, feel free to chime in as well, is that um, you know, most of the reasons of, of growth in, in websites is actually they're pretty close to each other um, in terms of why the drivers, what the drivers are. So it's both uh, multiple locations, it's both multiple stakeholder groups or customer segments as we see more personalized experiences online and then just need to meet the customer in their own terms across devices. Yeah, and I agree with you. And the interesting thing to me is even though you see most of them are fairly in the same ballpark <clears throat> with the exception of uh, multiple geographies or office, and that could very much be because of the size of the organization. Precisely. Uh, 
but I think the one that I'm, I'm a little surprised, actually, and, and many of these times as we look at the data, we start thinking about what, what's hidden in the data as well as what's shown, and customer user expectation because when I talk to marketing professionals and I talk to industry analysts and, and other people that are in the technology space and uh, in the marketing and the web content space, it's, it's all about the, the customer journey and trying to get that customer journey and trying to maximize that. So it, to me, it looks like even though everyone's talking about trying to maximize that and doing more advanced things, it's pretty much on par with some of the basic blocking and tackling. I have multiple products. I need to get that content up there. I've got uh, multiple audiences. I need to get some kind of messaging in there. I've got different business units I need to support. So I think this, this shows a little bit. It hints at some of the immaturity of the market and the good – far-reaching expectations and, and vision that a lot of organizations have, but they're still trying to handle a lot of the same basic blocking and tackling. Yeah, and I think we're always doing and just catch up with a consumer who's usually, you know, two, three steps ahead of us. So how do we actually meet them at their own terms? So I guess, um, you know, one way that companies are doing it is obviously through web content management or CMS system. So what was interesting for us to see in here is that um, we see a lot of companies managing or having um, multiple web content management or content management systems in place. The, the norm seems to be two to five, and um, you know, there are some, some folks who actually have a, a number of different CMS systems in place. So that was an interesting first question in establishing how technology is enabling marketers today to be effective and agile to meet the customer uh, need or the customer journey, as Robert mentioned. Yeah, and I think when you take a look at this, there is a natural progression of organizations and their web presences. Uh, so if we take a look at the how many websites does the department currently manage, you know, only a small percentage of them have just one because they start to expand out. So you know, when you open your business, you, it's like, wow, we have a website. That's fantastic. And you've got your .com and you're all happy, but then there are – suddenly you have support.companyname.com. Then you have – uh, something about you know partner.companyname.com, and they start to expand there, and then they start to expand even beyond that to uh, you know whether it's multiple brand and multiple countries, uh, things of that nature. So I think there's a natural expansion uh, from kind of supporting the different audiences to supporting you know multiple geos or multiple products or multiple brand lines. Right, and there's majority there's the business mature, so does your web uh web presence and the number of websites you need to manage. So to this end, we wanted to see how many websites you folks manage, if you can take a minute to answer that question. Yeah, I think it would be interesting. And by the way, folks, give yourselves full credit for uh, those, those subdomains. So if you know you've got, uh, <laughs> if you've got a partners and you've got a forum and you've got a blog, all that, because uh, they have different purposes. And I think that uh, people are surprised how quickly they proliferate. Uh, and as I'm looking at it, uh, we've got a very – we're actually mirroring pretty well yes. what we saw. Um, so, folks, you, you'll be able to see this when uh, we close the poll or after you enter some information. But, uh, you know, a boatload of two to fives, but uh, we've got as many over 50s as we do single, which yeah, is uh, interesting. pretty interesting to me. Yeah, definitely. But it's interesting that we have a number of folks who manage over 20 websites and over 50. So that's – um, hopefully, for, for those of you guys, we, we have uh, some, some interesting tidbits on, on how you can streamline um, the, the management of websites and, and what benefits you can get from that. Right. And so I'm, I know we, we were going to answer most of our questions at the end, but uh, so, uh, someone uh, just asked a question. Social sites shouldn't count, right? Well, if you're not managing them, I don't, I don't say they count. If you are you know, applying to social sites and putting things on Twitter or putting things through that, that's not a site you manage but a channel that you leverage. So, right, but uh, I think for the, for the purposes of this discussion, uh, Claudia, um, we are not looking at your Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook pages. Exactly. Right? Um, so we're looking at your digital or mobile presence. Um, for your organization, that could be a microsite, um, you know, that could be a full-fledged website, but um, yeah, social social sites don't count. Yeah, so I just want to make sure everyone had an opportunity to see that 43.5% two to five, but then we have, you know, eight almost nine percent at one and almost nine percent at five. So I think that's a pretty pretty interesting uh, breakout that we had that mirrors very closely what we saw in our uh, in our overall study. So. 
I'm not saying you folks are average, but you are reflecting the average pretty well. Right. Um, so that gets us to the next slide. And Robert hijacked my my uh, uh, slide controller here, going back and I, forth. <laughs> I apologize for that. You're going rogue on me. Um, so on this one, what we wanted to see is the number of uh, WCMs uh, uh, change by the the size of the organization, the organizational size, or their geographical presence. And um, what we're seeing here is that global companies are a lot more prone to using more systems. 22% of them use more than five systems in place. So you see as, um, as we go through this that uh, there's varying practices, but the more mature the organization, the more complex the number of sites that they need to manage and the more systems they actually have in place um, to do that. Um, what's interesting in here is that for uh, roughly 80% of the organizations with revenue in, in excess of 100 million, it, actually the norm is between two to five. So if you are uh, on the edge of managing 20 to 50 websites, um, the web content management systems, you're probably in the uh, growing minority of folks. Yeah, so what, what struck me as interesting here is that we, we see pretty much a definitive line of uh, the number of w WCMs used by organization size. But then when we take a look at by geographic presence, that, that kind of surprised me a little bit because um, you've got you know, 69, 67, 61%. Um, and it wasn't as big a change as I expected when we got the data back and we started to take a look at it. Because I figured you know, if you are a global company, you, know, you would have a lot of WCM systems uh, just because of the nature of how companies tend to grow. Because uh, having you know, worked for a number of large companies in my career, they, you know, a lot of large companies grow by acquisition, and they inherit a lot of different things. So I expected this to be uh, you know, even more pronounced at the global range. And it started to hint at something that I think, uh, not to steal our thunder from later on, <laughs> about kind of the development and the, kind of, and the exceptions that we saw to the rule where we expected to see a growth in an area and it didn't. Why did that happen? So I'm going to leave that as a teaser because I think we're going to get to it a little bit later on. But it was interesting to, to figure it out. And so I'll leave it in the minds of the people who are listening. Think about why would that happen. Let's see if your guess matches up with what we think might have happened as we go along. Great. Um, so one thing that we looked at as technology evolves, and especially as content management systems evolve into web content management systems, and they have multi-site management capabilities, you know, is that affecting um, folks, and are they starting to migrate to uh, CMSs or WCMs with multi-site management capabilities? So what we're seeing is that uh, about 30% of organizations are starting to have one CMS or web content management system that allows them to have multiple offshoots of websites, and that tends to be higher within global organizations. So that might explain some of the consolidation, if you will, uh, that we're seeing that most of them use between two and five CMSs um, because now they have the capability of spinning off multiple mobile and digital websites from that and managing them from one central platform. Yeah, so I, I, I found this really interesting when I uh, – do you have a WCM with, uh, with multi-site management in place? So we just saw before that there wasn't that big a change when it comes to numbers. But then we took a look at one country, 28%, several countries, 33%, so a, and then we've got global up to 44%. And I think when we have the I don't know in global, well, to me, that could be because they just don't have visibility into what's happening in their larger organization. So uh, I think we're starting to see the, the importance of, of multi-site management, and also they have it in place. So. Right. One of the reasons they're not worried about it is because I think the global organizations have actually been a little bit more proactive when it comes to them going out and saying, this is an important feature that we cannot live without. So I think that we're starting to see that trend hiding in the numbers. Exactly, and uh, budgets are not necessarily increasing exponentially as you're growing your business uh, in different countries or as you're launching different brands or different experiences. So it's not surprising that you know, global companies are, in, and um, you know, we're seeing the trend toward one CMS with multiple capabilities of launching and managing websites. So let's see what our audience is managing today. How many of you um, have a web content management system uh, uh, in a WCM? Uh, how many systems, I'm sorry, how many systems do you currently have to manage your websites? One, more than one. That's it. And yeah. one of the telling points is, you know, the folks that 
they don't know. So in other words, either they've got it nailed down or else it's not become a, a big business issue that we're hearing maybe across groups. Uh, so that's definitely a possibility. Or maybe we've got people who just you know, aren't involved in that function. But yeah. um, you sh- usually if you've got big issues on your website and you're in marketing, usually you hear about it. You're right. And maybe we'll talk about visibility and overall brand management approach a little bit later into the presentation. So uh, we'll get a sense from that. But interestingly, um, you know, majority of folks, about 36% don't know. All right. Great. Well, thank you for your responses. So um, let's see what the top challenges are of managing multiple websites. We went ahead and asked folks, so regardless of kind of what practice they have, what, uh, what CMS number CMS is in multi-site management capabilities, what, what they're facing as their top challenges. So one of the things that we found is that increasingly the management of websites is migrating from IT and going into marketing, which we marketers love to a certain extent, but, um, but when we have an issue, we have to go back to IT. So we know we are codependent and hopefully very collaborative with IT. But when you look at the number of folks that are involved across the board, you see that with increased number of of people and departments managing uh, multiple websites, it's becoming increasingly difficult to to have straightforward processes um, and ability to be agile. Yeah, I think it was was interesting because I've actually talked to – I have some uh, colleagues of mine from past lives, and I've talked to them that they're the directors of digital marketing. This is their job to manage this. And I actually said, I said, Mike, how do you actually go about and try to figure out what the best technology or how are you going to use it? And he never said I do it alone. He always said it's always a partnership between myself and a senior architect or an IT person that can help me make these decisions because, you know, it's becoming more and more technical. Uh, oftentimes because you're integrating with a lot of different systems on your, digi- on your uh, online property. So you know, he has to know whether he can integrate with uh, their homegrown CRM or their purchase marketing automation system or you know, their ability to integrate with uh, you know, something like a Google Analytics or any kind of third-party analytics platform. And so we're finding that it's becoming more of a strategic partnership, but what we also see a lot of happening is that you're seeing um, – they're trying to push down the line of when you have to call for IT help. So mm-hmm. marketers can be more self-supporting, uh, and they don't have to call IT until they get to a, a deeper level than they have historically. So we're seeing and hearing that, I mean, almost universally when it comes to the conversations that we're having out there in the market, that it's becoming more and more important for marketing to be a much more of a self-service organization uh, and only relying on the IT folks for the impl- you know, core implementation, core integration, and uh, extensibility. Great. And that actually takes us to the next slide, which touches upon some of the things that you just mentioned, Robert, that uh, there is a definitely a trend in uh, the rising cost of managing disparate websites, and most of our peers out there are worried that they are paying more than they should. Um, and those that are managing between uh, uh, 10 and 20 websites worry that they're paying, you know, they are, they are kind of the, the most worried within the group of, of folks. And, and, and part of this is, you know, this, the shift in how roles are being defined within different departments. Part of this is, you know, managing multiple websites and having to apply multiple resources, in some cases redundant, to be able to push content out and engage with customers, including the integration of these multiple websites back into the enterprise so you can have this full view of the customer across the different touch points. So, Laura, you know, I, I was waiting. You knew I was waiting to get to this slide. <laughs> because yes. I, we were, when we were reviewing the data, and, and uh, Scratch was kind enough to, to have me as part of the review team to take a look at the data, I looked at this, and, and I, just, I just jumped up, probably jumped out of my seat. I'm like, okay, why is – you see a normal progression of as things increase, they think, oh, we're paying more than we should. Things are getting harder. So 2 to 5 websites, 34%, 6 to 10, 48, 11 to 20, 50, and then 21 to 50, 12%. What in heaven's name? And you know, why did this dip so strongly here? And as we started talking through it, uh, one of, the, one of the, the theories, and again, you know, when we look at data, we always have hypotheses and theories that we try to apply to, to see if it makes sense to that data. And we said, okay, could this be? At the point where, okay, they are getting the job done and there's a certain level of bulk 
work that you can do. I'm just going to put more effort and work a few more hours, put more people on it, and I can get things done. Then there is the next step where there is some kind of technology that gets applied. And it's like, great, this, this works. But then as you grow and you extend, it hits a point where suddenly that technology works just fine to that point suddenly becomes unusable. And from that point, you have to say, okay, now we have to either augment it, buy something else, um, you know, create something on the fly, what have you. And so we started to see some dips, and, there, and these dips appeared in different parts of our data. And so I started you know, talking about them as scalability dips because it's, it's, it's hitting different places. And I think one of the things that everyone on the call might be looking for is, you know, tell me where I live. Tell me what the guardrails is for when I'm going to get in trouble. So it seems here that when you get to that 20-point uh, 20 site range, then things start to get a little bit more, well, a little bit easier. And, but then we get to the 50 range, that's when you start outgrowing a lot of the things that you that have been successful in the past. So when you grow to that 20 to 50 range, the equation seems to change. And then we see 57% saying we're paying more than we should. It seems that that's when they're applying level of, levels of effort that are Herculean and far beyond what uh, what they have in the past. I think that maybe the next one will help us think through some of the most significant challenges. Uh, I think it really gets to um, a number of operational uh, aspects of de designing, deploying, and uh, managing slash optimizing websites. So, um, you know, some of the challenges, of course, are the development and technical resources. If uh, you know uh, folks are still relying on the IT department to deliver the website, that becomes a choke point. In, uh, in a lot of organizations. The next one we see as uh, a challenge is ensuring brand consistency across all the websites, and we know that fragmentation leads to multiple different um, issues. Some of them are direct costs, some of them are opportunity costs. That's hard to measure in, uh, in, in, the re in real time, but um, have a long-term effect on, on brand image, brand appeal, brand consistency. Um, What's interesting, the other one is the disintegration with third-party systems. We know that with the flow of data from all of these social sites, you know, digital sites, and all of these digital breadcrumbs, we need to record them and make sure that we make sense of this data so we understand our customers better. So that's another key one. Time to market, obviously, is important. Um, and then this redundancy of effort across multiple websites. I'm sure most of you folks are facing this in uh, on, on our side as an agency, we, we do see this across the board. We're trying to rationalize more and more on one type of digital marketing system, CMS system, that allows us to have multi-site management capabilities. And here we pulled some of the quotes from, from the respondents, and I'm sure most of you can relate um, to what folks had to share with us. Um, and, and, Laura, and, and Laura, when I started thinking about some of the, the pain points that, you know, that we see, um, when people grow to that extent, um, there tends to be whenever you have a difference, you get uh, you get the, the kind of change of pace. So if I'm working in one system and then I got to switch to the other, I have to kind of reconfigure my brain to say, oh wait, a minute, I have to do this differently here. So when you, whenever you have multiple systems of different types of CMSs, you've got a, a different level of ability and a different process for marketers to do that to get their job done without developer support. So even if it's a non-technical environment, it tends to be a little different, and that takes a little time to reconfigure. Uh, but then it gets even more complex when you talk about if I have different systems, and let's say I'm putting out a press release, and I've got my core system, but that, has to be, that press release has to go out in all the different web properties I have across the world. So whether, even if you keep it simple and say, well, I have to put it out in English everywhere, Great, but you, you still have to propagate that change. And if you have to translate in different languages, that becomes more, even more difficult, especially if you have to do it at a particular time. Uh, then you've got, if you want to extend your solution, and, and many of the people we talk to, that's what they want to do. It's like, I've got some CMS, I've got my website, but then I, need to, I want to add this, whether it's a, you know, a, a shopping cart or an ability to uh, some kind of um, find the store locator or whatever the application happens to be they build that in different stacks. So whether it's you know, PHP or .NET or something like Cold Fusion from Adobe, uh, then you have to actually build that in different languages. And then you have to upgrade it and keep it bug-free in different languages. And then when you talk about upgrades, if you're having some kind of connection between two systems and then one gets upgraded and the other one doesn't, or they upgrade at different times, 
that's painful. And then when that happens, you have different supporting processes. So I have to call one vendor versus another, and what's the time availability, and then you get into finger pointing. And those are just all challenges that are hiding under the covers. You, you folks can see that uh, Robert has intimate knowledge about all the pain points that folks experience, and it's true. I mean, we see this on our site as well um, uh, as a uh, digital marketing agency too. So one of the things that was interesting to us is, you know, we always say you can measure, uh, you can manage that, you, that is not uh, um, uh, a measure. So what we wanted to see folks had global visibility into the, the websites that they manage and, and what level. And what we're seeing is that they are <coughs> most folks don't have complete visibility in what's, uh, in what's happening with their digital properties, um, be that IT or marketing. And that becomes a more pronounced problem for global organizations. Some of this is, of course, uh, expected. Um, but um, what's what's interesting here is this this idea that if if you don't understand what's happening and if you have multiple groups, for example, we have one client who has uh, a SharePoint site that's really really hard to manage. So what's happening in these different uh, global divisions are constantly launching microsites without the knowledge of the uh, digital marketing team. And guess what? The opportunity costs are huge because what these groups are doing is they're sending eyeballs to microsites that don't get updated after a while. Um, you pay for these eyeballs multiple times to, um, to get them to your content. And at the end of the day, the cost per acquisition and the sales cycles get impacted tremendously even if we don't have um, the immediate visibility into that. Yeah, that's a great okay. point. I just want to point out, just remember that 61% um, that was up there before, and it was 61% of global organizations feel they only have a partial view. Just remember that stat as we move along. Right. And what is interesting uh, uh, for us as marketers to look at, what are the kind of the prevalent brand management approaches out there? And uh, are brands enforcing a uniformed brand approach, or are they somewhat lax, or you know how is that distributed? And what's interesting is that, and I think Robert pointing to um, the teaser that you planted a few slides before, you can see that global organizations are much more strict about having uniform brand standards as opposed to those in one country, although the the, the delta is not that big. But what's interesting is here is that no global organization has lax brand standards. So the ability to manage the brand and uh, to present a consistent image and a consistent experience for the customer seems to be a lot more important and top of mind for global organizations as opposed to those that are based in one country. So we're seeing this is why we're seeing some of the challenges as the companies mature or become bigger that they need a different tool set um, to, to manage their digital and mobile properties. Okay, so this is something, and I, I see this a lot in, in types of studies that I've seen done over the years, that when you start looking at a couple data points and you find out that they're really not in alignment, and it's kind of a perception versus reality because you've got people telling you one thing, but then when you see, uh, see another fact, it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't quite match up. And this slide and the 61% the from that prior slide and the 58% we see here on the lower right this is visibility for websites managed by other groups of departments. You see that in companies of over 1 billion, 58% say they have a partial view. But the same global organizations, and I would assume that companies over a billion dollars are probably global, that 61% of those global organizations say that they have a uniform brand and their content standards are enforced. How can you have strictly enforced content standards if you only have partial visibility into it 58% of the time. So I think that I, people say, well, we've got our standards and we know what they are and we do our best to strictly enforce them, but in many cases they don't have the infrastructure and the visibility to actually do that job. So I right. thought that was an interesting data point. That's a great data point, and he talks about this this uh, the slide that we were on before, where you know folks with 20 sites seem to have mastered how to manage them because technology is there, and those that are over 50, they start to see some issues. So let's look at the negative impact of having sil siloed website management. Um, so what what's happening is we ask folks whether they're worried about revenue opportunities uh, being left on the table, and as you can see. You know, it's uh, it's pretty big worry for those that are starting out with multiple websites and those that have 50 plus websites. It is this, uh, you know, this realization that if you don't do something about consolidating, 
your presence and having the, the tool set to enforce the brand standards that we talked about, you are actually leaving real dollars on the table. And, and this is another one of those uh, the slides that kind of get me kind of excited because I start seeing that kind of scalability dip again. So here we see at 11 to 20 sites, suddenly people are only 19% worried that they are missing revenue opportunities, meaning that they've got a pretty good sense of security uh, that they are that they're you know they're finding the revenue that everything's running pretty well, but then it starts to grow from up from 19 to 29 to 43 uh, percent after that. So I think it's one of those signs that within that you know 11 to 20, 25, 30 into that range of websites that people start to get a handle on it, but then when they go above it, things start to get a little bit out of the hand. So I think there is a kind of a an outgrowing point in that range when it comes to scalability that people are finding. So if you are approaching that number of sites that you are supporting, and you might need to take a look at how you're doing things and think, wow, this might be that apex point that uh, I might start going downhill if I don't really take a hard look at my processes and how the upcoming needs of growth are going to affect it. Right, because you're not only leaving money on the table, but if we look at the overall total cost of ownership of new site additions as brands are growing, um, essentially you're seeing a pretty bleak picture again. And we promise there's only one more concern you guys need to know about based on the data, and then we'll move to the brighter side of the picture, what you can do about this. But essentially what we're seeing is that the majority of organizations are worried about operational and management inefficiency. They're worried about lack of agility, and that goes back to, well, if we need to be responsive to the customer, how could we be? And then this increased total cost of ownership that, that spans multiple different aspects from, you know, deployment, multiple resources to duplicate hosting um, costs, uh, what have you. Yeah, I think the interesting thing that I find here, Laura, is about the uh, significant challenge of inconsistent branding. And I think that might be the case because it's just the hardest to measure. Right. A lot of these things are probably a little bit more straightforward. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. So let's ask folks. Um, uh, we wanted to see if you're using a CMS or a web management system that has multi-site management capabilities. Let's see. So I see a goodly number of folks say they do. All right. Good for you folks. Well, Laura, I think the next study that we do should be digging into, you know, when it comes to the details behind multi-site, what works on those systems and what needs to be improved. I think that would be good for not only vendors like uh, us here at the 104 World of Site Affinity, but uh, the, the industry in general, because I think uh, there are going to be more and more challenges as things get more and more complex in the digital and mobile worlds. Yep. Yeah, you sign me on. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Okay, All right. so... Um, the the other thing that we wanted to look at is um, this this aspect of do we do we actually suffer from brand fragmentation, and to what extent? Um, so we are seeing some significant brand inconsistencies, uh, significant and somewhat significant. As to Robert, you appointed those are hard to measure, but we know that viscerally or anecdotally we know that that is an issue. So you can see that 50% of brands have had significant issues. And that actually exacerbates as uh, the size of the organization um, grows, and we're looking at these inconsistencies jumping to 70%. Yeah, and there we go, one of those other dips. And as you can tell probably by listening to me over the last uh, 40 minutes or so, those get are really exciting for me because it's, I'm seeing it again, that 25 to $100 million range where suddenly people think that they have things under control. And then when they move up to that 100 million to 1 billion, things start getting more out of control at 39% and up to 42% uh, for significant branding consistencies. So uh, again, this, it sh it's showing a, through a lot of different measures that there seems to be an outgrow point that's happening in that kind of mid-growth of organizations. Uh, so it, it's, a good for, it's a good telling for small organizations that are hitting that point and also the mid-sized organizations that might be growing into pain. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It seems to be consistently the dip that uh, you're pointing out. So let's ask folks um, if they agree with the statement, having multiple CMSs increases our overall total cost of ownership. Yes, no, or don't know. 
personally love that we're getting absolutely no no's at this point. Oh, there we go. Uh, there, there are a few. A few people there. You can there. always change your mind. You can always change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> but we are right. getting, uh, yeah, the two-thirds, two-thirds, or over two-thirds now are saying, yes, that uh, it's increasing the overall cost of ownership. But apparently other people, maybe they've got some great processes and maybe they've got just, uh, they've got some magic pixie dust that helps them out a lot. Um, <laughs> But yeah, or they're just really good at their jobs, and they found a way to overcome exactly. the challenge that the other folks are still still seem to be facing. Great. Okay, so um, good news for those um, who have uh, migrated to multi-site management uh, to web content management systems with multi-site management capabilities. Here's what we're finding: what the emerging best practices are, and what you know, folks on on the line can learn. Um, there are many benefits of actually consolidating on one CMS system that allows you to uh, launch multiple websites and then manage them um, through through this uh, sort of core tool set. Um, you have less development from IT and developers uh, for the maintenance of these websites. It really shows that marketers are more in control and you have the ability to change um, and adapt to things. You know, I always give this example of if Facebook is uh, releasing about 2 to 300 uh, software up updates a day, we as marketers need to be able to market at the same speed. And if we don't have the tool set to tweak things on the go and, and see how uh, the customer is reacting, then we are really hampered. In, uh, in our ability to attract and keep our customers. You see low cost to update design and content. That is absolutely the case. I speak from experience and not only from the data that once you have a centralized system, it becomes a lot easier. You have one centralized database. You have one centralized content repository. It becomes a lot easier to adapt as you, as you go through um, uh, your different properties. There's less development cost for each website, and you know how these can be blown out of proportion. Uh, if you are going with different CMSs or different vendors or you are trying to do it yourself, and there's the, the lower hosting cost as well. I think that the big thing when I looked at this one was you know, lowering hosting costs. It's really it's just not about that. It's all about doing things better, being able to, uh, to expand and grow better. You're going to be paying for hosting costs. You're going to be paying for infrastructure. That's just going to happen. Um, you can't get away from it. But when it comes to being able to rely on developers uh, less often, being able to get things up and, up and updated quick, more quickly, uh, that's really where the benefits are with this multi-site management equation. Exactly. And then we look at brand agility. Here's what happens. We can become a lot more responsive to what we need to do. Um, and you can see that those who have, again, a web CMS system, web content management system with multi-site management capabilities can quickly update sites. So that this is what we just talked about. Test and confirm. This is what um, is really important to us today. Uh, develop a, a rapid response to customers and adapt to what they have. And then this ability to test new offers and see what works and not have to wait for days or weeks to get the results back and then adapt from there. So. Um, what we found is that there is, I mean, 99% to let's just say everybody really agrees and is unanimous that uh, their ability to adapt their websites quickly on the go is one of their top priorities. As basic as it sounds, I think we we have not had the skill set just a few years ago. I firmly agree with that. Um, so then we looked at what are the major reasons that people are doing this consolidation, moving from multiple mo uh, web content management systems or CMS systems to one that has this uh, multi-site capability, and uh, you know, streamlined planning for each website uh, is uh, kind of at the bottom of it. And if we start kind of looking at the bottom up, again, similar themes that we saw before. Um, pretty much consistently everyone sees the benefits of consolidated programming and development, unified design, improved content management, brand consistency, ease of launching new websites, and just overall a streamlined process. So, you know, those who have um, the majority of folks uh, who have, you know, consolidated are, are quoting that as a benefit. So the interesting thing is, you know, we all we are looking over the data to try to find either, you know, those apex points or those break points of the inconsistencies. And when we looked at this, we we're like, well, there's there are obviously no inconsistencies here. They're all important. But to me, that's what it was all about. It's like, well, between important factor or somewhat important factor, the lowest percentage is 90% on all of these. So when it comes to why should you do this, 
you've got your list. So for anyone out there who's trying to justify uh, making a change and want to know why, this is a slide that you show to your CMO or to your board of directors and say, this is what we need to do, and this is backed up by, by data of what, why people actually consider this. Right, and if you need one more, uh, you know, it's something that I guess global companies can figure it out. And we, you know, we, uh, the companies that are based in one region, we don't know yet, is that the ease of launching websites is is a huge factor. And a web content management system with one site capabilities really allows you to do that very, very easily and quickly. So this time to market, time to value becomes. Uh, a very important factor. As, important, as, as a matter of fact, this is the factor for global companies. And I think, uh, and that's what's truly amazing about this. You see, a hundred percent under global. And you know, the example that I always tend to think of is if you think about some of these major food conglomerates that are out there, and they not only need to support all their food brands and have a website for you know, whether it's a you know a cake mix or a, you know a a a sports drink or maybe it is you know you know, spices, I don't know, anything in that area, and they have those. But now, not only do they have to put up their product information, but they have to put up nutritional information, and they're also trying to uh, co connect with their users so they have recipes that are being put up on a regular basis. So you can think about the ability to launch all of these different types of sites so quickly, especially in a global world with global markets. That becomes more well, imagine important. if you're Oreo, right, and you figure out that, uh, you know, you can dunk your cookie, um, and, and, and that's a, a, a very uh, sticky campaign that with one punch of a button you can essentially update all of your global sites and have the same experience perpetuated. Um, as so, Laura, as well. I hate to tell you this. If you just figured out you can dunk your Oreo and it tastes good, you're a little behind the times. <laughs> well, just you know, that, that, that reference came to mind. I agree. I, had, I knew but that one was You were a very potent an example. <laughs> I got all you. Right. Um, okay, so we are at the end of it. Um, so if Robert, if you want to um, kind of wrap up and then we can open it up for some questions. Sure. Uh, and now these are just some of the things that we pointed out as, as we went for. I just wanted to just put them up as the trends, the conclusions, and you know, the guardrails if you see yourself in any of these areas. So there does seem to be some kind of maturity breakpoint around that 20 website range whether it's the cost of managing the disparate sites, whether it's missing out on revenue, or whether it's brand inconsistencies. It seems to be that this is when things can get really, really tough, where you mature out of the way you did things in the past, and you're growing into that larger area, and the data really backs it up and, and shows it. But I think we also have to be very, very aware as marketers, is, and also management people, not just marketers, is that sometimes we have to look at ourselves a little more harshly. Even though we think we've got things under control, if the data doesn't support it, things like not having good visibility, but you think you've got control of your brand, well, that's something that I think we all have to look at and say, is there a way we can do this better? So if you're going to that growth range, fine. If you see some facts here, you think that, wow, if I apply that to my organization, I think we might have some of the same challenges when it comes to perceptions versus realities. Those are things that I think that you might want to take back with you as kind of, of the one slide that you think about from this presentation. So with that said, uh, we just want to give you our contact information and start answering. We've got some questions that have already come in over the course of the, uh, of the presentation, and we do have some time left that we can answer a few of those. Uh, but if you have questions that you have and you want to answer them now, uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Um, now, some people are asking about the presentation. Uh, you, have pre the, you will get a chance to get the recording of the presentation, but you also will get a copy of the, uh, the report that's going to be coming out. So it is a, a pretty lengthy report. Uh, we found we had just a whole lot of data that we wanted to talk about. So it is a bit of a tome, but I think you can leave through it pretty easily and get some great information that you'd like to utilize uh, with, your, uh, with your teams and your organization. And we affectionately so, call that the ultimate guide. So yeah. <laughs> you guys, you guys or the unholy that. mess, depending on uh, how we get about <laughs> yeah. it. So while we, while we start at the beginning, uh, and again, folks, if you have questions, feel free to answer them, and then we will, uh, we will answer those as well. So the first one, we, um, we're uh, see, it's question number one. We are going to be adding sites outside the U.S. in 2016. What should we watch out for? Um, so Laura, I'll, t I'll take the first shot at that, and you can, you can pile on if you'd like. 
I think the one thing that I would be concerned with is to make sure that if you're adding them, that you tr a, try to put them on the same infrastructure. It's going to be a lot easier. But the thing that catches up most people uh, is a lot about translation. Uh, because not only uh, are things having to be translated, but also your approach has to be translated as well. So whether you are doing things uh, visually, and sometimes the different visual metaphors have to change, or whether you're doing things that are doing just linguistically, uh, I would say try to automate as much of your translation process as possible, but not the actual translation. As anyone who's ever gone and taken a sentence and put it from, on Google Translate from English to another language and then back to English and see some of the changes, it's, it's actually pretty interesting how even a pretty good translation engine like Google can uh, help you, that can mess things up as you move ahead. So, uh, and then I would also say make sure you work in your time frames because I've seen many companies actually get caught in try thinking they can get things done faster than they could when it comes to translating and transferring to other locales. Laura, any comments? No, I think you got it. Okay. <laughs> the next one I love, Laura. Uh, so it is, who should own the website? Our IT department does, and it's really painful sometimes. <laughs> You want to take that one, or you want me to take it? Sure, sure. I think that um, as you as as we saw, depending on where you are in the journey, if you're starting with one website, obviously, and that that's the, the easy thing, you probably can make some quick decisions, and you're not going to make huge mistakes if you're starting on one. But if you're growing, if you have more than two, three, four, and, and onward. Um, I think you, you do need to partner with IT because sometimes what we don't know is the hidden cost of actually picking the right technology, understanding how it's connected with other systems um, that we have as marketers. So uh, I do believe, and maybe may my slanted view, that marketing still needs to own the website uh, and the customer experience, and they need to create the right set of requirements for IT to help out with. And then aside from this collaboration, once the websites are launched, then marketers do need to have the ability to maintain, update, and analyze the data so we can do a better job tomorrow servicing our customers. Agreed. And, and so let me add one thing on to that. So I would advise anyone to say, okay, it's the website. Marketing is the client. IT is the vendor. Their job is to give you their expert technical advice on how to achieve your goals as a marketing team. If, if those roles change, and I think that many times they do, I th that's when people tend to get into trouble, where IT starts to dictate how marketing is going to do things. I think it has to be a really much defined as a client-vendor type of relationship, and I think that your CMO has to step up and talk to the CIO and say, this is the way it has to be, or else we're not going to achieve our business goals. All right, and so here we have a related question. Should the CMO be involved in the website management approach? So can I take this one? <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. I, I, <laughs> I think that the CMO needs to understand where technology has evolved and what technology can do because sometimes CMOs don't necessarily understand the marketing infrastructure that supports the enterprise. So by all means, they need to be involved in enabling their marketing department to make the right call so it's not just relegated to the, to the head of IT or the CIO of the organization. We do need to be an equal participant at the table, but at the same time, we need to bring those folks who know how to integrate systems and how to choose the right scalable systems to the table to make that a reality. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't answer it better. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got time for, I think, a few more questions. Let's go to this one. I have four content management systems, and I need to pick the right one to consolidate on. What should I be looking for? All right, uh, I'll, I'll take my first shot at that. Um, I think it has to be it has to be a balance uh, because you might have four different solutions that work very well for what they do today. You have to take a look at where you're growing and what will consolidate uh, all as many of your websites as you can on one infrastructure. And that really takes two different things. One, the ability for marketing to get things done quickly on that system. And another thing for your IT or development staff to actually develop on that system if they need to extend it or customize or modify it. So if you've got a bunch of .NET developers, don't get a PHP, what's, called, what's referred to as the LAMP stack, of technology solutions because then you're going to just be either hiring or retraining. 
So I think you have to look at what is your long-term goal and how that can be solved by whichever is the best candidate amongst your four solutions. And I don't envy you that <laughs> process because I'm sure that you've got four different teams that all love their own solution and they want to keep it. So it's actually as much of a political or social challenge you're going to have as a technology and business one. Laura, anything you want to add to that one? No, I think uh, you are the pro in this. I, uh, I really would uh, uh, listen to you in this case, and you would be the first person I call if I have that issue. <laughs> You're way too kind. All right, let's see. Oh, we get time for a couple more, and then I think uh, we're going to let everyone go to the rest of their day. Uh, of all the problems you mentioned, which ones are the most common? Oof, that's a tough one. That um, is a tough one. I mean, we can make we can make our best guess on that, um, and I think when we take a look back at the data. Um, I would probably say that uh, it's not in one particular slide, but I would say quality and agility. So maintaining the quality across all your infrastructure and the, ability, and the agility to change things quickly seem to pop their head up in a lot of different areas in the study, uh, but it, it comes down to that. So you can get the work done, and you can usually, you know, throwing enough enough people, enough hours of things, and enough money at it, you can get it done. But to do it in a way that maintains your quality and can get things done fairly quickly, I think it's probably the thing that I see more than anything in all the data that we reviewed. The other thing or, is it depends on where you are on the maturity scale. So um, I think that it's uh, kind of, to me now, it's becoming a no-brainer. If you're about to, to launch multiple websites or you need to ma manage multiple websites, consolidate on one platform. Because once you do that, you can do – this is the foundation, right? This is where you can get the economies of scale, the, the brand consistency, the ability to respond, and the quick time to market. That ability then helps you learn what the customer is doing a lot better than having siloed uh, websites. And then you can do a lot more uh, with, with your marketing efforts, which is nirvana for most marketers. So I think first, um, you know, take care. That's the most common problem figure out how to consolidate and how to centralize the management of your websites, and then from there get to this uh, uh, common pool of data so that you can do a lot more uh, with, uh, with your marketing and with your customers. Well, I see uh, by the clock on the wall that we are about at 2 o'clock. So uh, personally, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today, and I hope you got some things out of it and look forward to getting, uh, getting your hands on that report. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everyone, on, uh, on the send as well. And thank you, Emma and Anthony. All back to you. Thanks so much, Robert and Laura. Thank you as well. Great information. So we really appreciate you both being here with us today. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone, as I mentioned at the start, we are recording the full presentation. And Robert mentioned as well, we are going to be sharing a link to the recording. So you'll have uh, a chance to go back and revisit all this great information at your convenience. You can share it. Uh, again, just look for that coming your way soon. Um, a lot of you also shared on Twitter today. So thank you for being a part of that. If you weren't able to engage uh, during the webcast, you can still go post a bit and engage at hashtag digital marketing. And here in just a moment, we're going to redirect you to our survey page. And if you would, just take a moment or two, give us a little bit of feedback on today's webcast. Also, let us know what topics you want to see us present on future AMA webcasts. We uh, really kind of take that to heart and uh, try to put out the information that you are looking for. So in advance, thank you so much for your help with that. And in closing, I want to extend a big thank you to Telerik, the creators of Sitefinity, for sponsoring today's webcast, as well as to ReadyTalk for providing the platform that we use. And if you want to learn more about ReadyTalk and their services, you can go to readytalk.com forward slash AMA. And then last, of course, I want to thank you, the audience, for sharing an hour from your busy day with us. We certainly hope you found this information helpful, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon on another AMA Thought Leadcast. That does end our presentation for today. Thanks again for joining everyone. Have a great rest of your day.